I'm Spencer Levy, and this is The Weekly Take. Three words, grocery anchored retail. We've been discussing and debating this asset class all year, and now we're going to the store with a grocery retailer that's on the move. On this episode, we return to Las Vegas, site of the 2022 ICSC Recon Convention, to learn more about a growth-oriented grocery chain with lots more than food on its shopping list. I've worked in food retail most of my life, and I would say not only is this the most fun place I've worked before, but it's just so different. We try and do what other people don't do. That's Dave McGlinchey, the Chief Strategy Officer for Sprouts Farmers Market, which has expanded to nearly 400 locations around the country. For his part, Dave spent more than 25 years in retail, primarily in the grocery space, building new stores, new formats, and new business for a variety of companies. Why so many retailers like Grocery Anchor is because effectively you're getting people coming back two and a half, three times a week. And that's still very, very important for the co-tenants of groceries. And that's Brandon Famous, an executive vice president with CBRE's global retail platform. Brandon specializes in representing retailers in site acquisition and expansion. Over the course of his decades-long career, he has completed more than 2,000 retail lease transactions, totaling more than 20 million square feet of space around the world. Coming up, a conversation about a retailer that's focused on growth, experience, and a commitment to efficiency and sustainability in its business practices and its real estate strategy. Sprouts Farmers Market, that's right now on The Weekly Take. Welcome to The Weekly Take, and we are joined today by two terrific retail experts, one a longtime friend of mine, Brandon Famous. Brandon, great to see you. Great to see you, Spencer. It's been a long time. It's been a long time. And Dave McGlinchey. Dave, thank you so much for joining. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Dave, let's go into what Sprouts is, the brand, because I don't think all of our listeners, particularly uh, maybe in the Northeast, don't know who you are. Tell us a little bit more about that. Yeah, for, first I'll tell you, I've, I've been in this business for a long time, and it's my favorite place I've ever worked. Um, And it's because we have this higher purpose. So we're trying to bring healthy living across the United States. We're very fresh food focused. Um, I think we're experts in produce. Um, We're low price in produce, which is very unusual. Um, And with this kind of affordable concept of healthy food, and we're a growing brand, um, that's an exciting thing to be part of. But but it's everything, I hate to use the expression from soup to nuts, but you can get full meals there. It's meat, fish, cheese, everything. Yeah, we have a terrific uh, meat program, produce, deli. Meals have been growing like crazy, and uh, we prepare meals in the store, which is great, but you can get vitamins, groceries, dairy, et cetera. So it's a full grocery shop, um, but we're typically a second shop because we don't sell Tide and Bounty and Frito-Lay, et cetera. But most of it's local, or you try to make as much of it local as you can. Yeah, absolutely. Like I said, I've worked in food retail most of my life, and I would say not only is this the most fun place I've worked before, but it's just so different. We try and do what other people don't do. From a product point of view, from a team member point of view, one of our core values is we love being different. Um, And part of that is, you know, we don't want to carry the same items that a Kroger or an Ahold or an Albertsons would carry is we want to be something very different, more focused on health and wellness and healthy lifestyle uh, for people. And I think we have terrific team members in the store that make the store come to life and I think are a great asset to what we do every day. Well, I think, um, Brandon, the way that uh, was just described uh, by Dave about having something different Mm -hmm. and having something cool. I don't know if you use the word cool, but I'm going to use the word cool. I'll take it. But I think it leads to the shopping experience. And that's really the fundamental change, I think, that we've seen uh, in the last decade or so, where stores that really focus on a differentiated experience are those that are uh, separating themselves from the pack. What do you think, Brandon? Uh, That's a good point, Spencer. And one of the things that's what makes Sprout so great is that You know, we walk in and meet with landlords, property owners. It is a different offering. And to that point, the experience with it. And when you're talking with Sprouts, when you're able to do a deal with Sprouts, it really leads to the other co-tenancy, like-minded type retailers that go into the center. So you're getting away from what was the old school strip center or the old school power center. And now they're able to recreate, uh, reimagine 
the centers that in many cases in today's world need to be reimagined. So again, it, it's, it's a unique offering for many, many landlords. If you go to like old school retail, you, you talk about co-tenancy clauses. You have both the good co-tenancy, people you want to be with, and you have the bad co-tenancy. Nobody ever wanted to be next to a bowling alley as a yeah. old school example. But what we're saying here is that people want to be near you or you want to be near others not because of their products per se, but because of their values. Is that a fair way to put it? Yeah, and I think there's definitely cohesion around. Mm -hmm. So people who have the same, call it profile of customer or profile of lifestyle. We just had a great meeting with the folks at F45. Mm -hmm. um, and we're so aligned in what we're trying to do and the type of customer going after. It's slightly more affluent, super health conscious, right? They're a gym and we sell health food and supplements. And we think there's some business we can do together. Um, but tenants like that, I think, that just bring more to the center that's not the same. Actually, one of the examples we're doing in a, in a coffee shop was, you know, the same coffee shop that's in every supermarket. We don't want to do things like that. We want to do things different. So having more unique offerings in a center is, is terrific, I think. One of the things that we talk about a lot, and you guys don't have this issue because you're big enough now that you actually have good credit but many of these smaller retailers might not. And we have this balancing act, which we call between credit and cool. Yeah. And uh, how, how do you look at that? Yeah, I, we're super fortunate. So we made the Fortune 500 yeah. last year, yeah. uh, which was a big deal, right? Um, and for us is I think we have the benefit of we're a publicly traded company. But also, we was, like internally, we feel like a startup. You know, it feels like you're kind of an entrepreneur working in our company, um, which is very different than a lot of other places um, where I've worked, where it's just, you know, every day is kind of the same and, and you're kind of, um, you know, doing the same as other people. Well, a prior guest that we had on the show was the uh, chief of real estate for Allbirds, which is a yeah, uh, company sure. that makes shoes and apparel. But, I mean, I think I could have ripped a page out of their yeah. uh, corporate guide and, and stuck it onto Sprouts. It's, just, it's so similar. But I think what it speaks to um, is not just how the consumer is evolving to care more, not about the goods but about the overall value proposition for the company. I think, by the way, it's the same thing for office employees as well. Brandon, what do you think? Yeah, I agree with you. I mean, it's you're looking at a consumer now. You, you know, obviously we can talk about millennials, Gen Z, et cetera. But again, when you're, you're going into what Sprout's offering is, it's that fresh. It's able to touch it, feel it, smell it kind of thing. And it's not just cookie cutter, which is all part of the experience. Very, very important. Every real estate person I've had on my show, I say, are you in the real estate business? And I, and nine out of 10 say, no, I'm a technology company. No, I'm an information company. So I'm gonna ask you, Dave. Dave, are you a grocer? No, I would say we're not a grocer. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I'd say we, we're trying to bring healthy living uh, to more places across the US, less, less about being a grocery store. So speaking of grocery, Brandon, you've been in the business a long time. Groceries evolved over the last 30 years. How have you seen the evolution of that segment of the market, Brandon, you know, in the last 20, 30 years? And what well, brings us to today? Um, great point. It, it actually, great question. It's become more specialized. So you see the likes of Sprouts, of other, other competitors out there um, trying to do the same thing. I think you either have to be really big, right, Walmart, Target, Kroger, or really specialized. Mm -hmm. Everyone in that mushy middle is having the hardest time because there's nothing special about them. They do the same as the bigger guys, but they, they don't have all the efficiencies of being really big. But, I, as, but as much as they change, Spencer, remember this, though, why it's important, why so many retailers like Grocery Anchor is because effectively you're getting people recurring clients. They're coming back two and a half, three times a week. And that's still very, very important for the co-tenants of grocery. So many landlords still look for grocery anchored strip centers, open air centers. Well, one of the things about grocery as opposed to, say, an appliance store is that a washing machine is a washing machine, but a tomato is not a tomato, right. particularly if you're a cook. Yep. And so do you think that will ever go away? Do you think the internet is ever going to disrupt your business? No, I mean, especially for us, it's like yeah. fresh food is a huge piece of our business and kind of differentiated fresh too. So we'll, you know, when it comes to stone fruit season or something, we'll have all these cool specialty, you know, plums and nectarines and things like that. So you won't normally order that online, right? You don't see it. But if all of a sudden you try this really cool peacherine, you'll be like, oh my gosh, this is terrific. So I think the experience of being in a cool store 
that in and of itself, and for us too, we're a smaller store. Mm-hmm. You know, our new format's 23,000 square feet. You can get in and out pretty easily. And if you're gonna select your own meat and produce and whatever, I really think the customers aren't gonna do that. But will they order Bounty online and Tide and Coke? For sure, sure. because it's everywhere, right? Yeah, I mean, in many ways, you almost feel like it's neighborhood grocery, right? Yeah. Like, it's big enough that you have the offering, but it's about the freshness. It's the produce. It's the meats. It's the bakery section. All of that is so key. That's the one thing that I really, really like about the brand. And we're always trying to change our assortment, too. So, I mean, the cool thing about our store is, like, every week there's something new in the store. We're constantly changing things out. So, it's kind of an exploration going on our store trying to see what's different. Mm-hmm. Well, I'm going to use the term peacherine. <laughs> there you go. Because uh, I had not heard the term before, yeah. <laughs> but I'm going to check it out. But, so let's turn to real estate now, a little bit more just granular on real estate. Mm-hmm. 23,000 square feet, your optimal size. But the typical grocer, I guess we say the, the big ones could be 50, 60, 70,000 square feet. Uh, but the little guys or the smaller ones could get even smaller than that. How'd you pick 23,000 square feet as your optimal size? Yeah, so it's funny. We have a relatively new CEO. He's been with us a couple of years. In early days, he went in and and he goes into Southern California, which is some of our earliest stores. And we have all these 16,000, 20,000, you know, 22,000 square foot stores that feel terrific, a lot of energy in them, and the sales in those stores are terrific. And he's like, why are we building these really big stores? We're a farmer's market. We should be more intimate, exciting, et cetera. And sales per square foot are way better in these smaller stores. So we said, all right, we, we can do just as much business and offer a, a better experience probably in a smaller store. So you mentioned your sales per square foot, and we're talking about uh, traditional real, retail metrics, the health ratio, the ratio of your sales to your rent um, sales per square foot, which, which you also mentioned. But we now, you know, even though the internet has not penetrated your segment, uh, I've used the concept um, a few times, which I call new rent. I'll be very simple, right? Yeah. If you are a retailer and you are in a particular location and not necessarily a grocer because grocer doesn't have as much internet penetration, but say you have 20% of your sales are internet sales, right? your store is not just a place to buy stuff. It's also a billboard. And that billboard has value in terms of the sales in that area. Is that a piece of the economic puzzle that uh, should be part of the negotiation or is it a bridge too far, Brandon? I think it's a bridge too far because now you're getting into, you know, if, if I'm understanding what you're theorizing, it's that if it's not just a retail store, but it's also a logistics store, it's pickup. They're buying online pickup. Is that where you're going with it? Well, it's either that or if somebody's sitting in their house and it gets delivered to their homes. Or delivery as well. Mm-hmm. So you're saying, how do you account for those sales? Yes. I'm saying, how do you account? And I'm going one step further than that. Not just counting the sales, right. but I'm saying that if you are negotiating a new lease, should that be part of the lease negotiation? Uh, I would tell you, hell no. The big thing from a retailer point of view, you just yeah. say it's your brand, yes. right? And your marketing of the brand and, you know, et cetera, less to do with that particular center, right? It's kind of like, you know what, Spencer? You, you remind me of something. It's these landlords, speaking of tenor rep, the landlords that always try to throw into the net charges their marketing or their promo fund for the center. Mm-hmm. And all I do is tell them, you want to charge me a dollar a foot or 50 cents a square foot, your promo on the center? We as a company or our client, Sprouts, as a company, will spend 20 times the amount of money on advertising. Maybe we should get a deduction in our rent for doing that, <laughs> promoting your center. They don't buy it, and we don't buy it, and we end up fighting. But I like it. We get uh, through it. For the record, this is why Brandon is good at what he does. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Uh, so let's talk locations now. I know that most of your product, and I, we do took a look at your footprint, uh, you had a lot of stuff in uh, – is it California? I'm getting the states right here. Yeah, California, Texas, Colorado, Arizona, yeah. and now Florida, yeah. which was relatively non-existent five years, mm-hmm. and we've been at a sprint in growing Florida. But all of those are what we would call the highest growth, macro growth, right? Yeah. The most people moving in there. Yeah. Uh, you can include Charlotte, Nashville. I mean, we could – Raleigh. I mean, there's a lot yeah. of cities we could pick yeah. – include in that. But – your sub-demographic, you can't just look at the aggregate number of people. You're also looking for a certain type of person, certain income um, level, maybe other factors. What do those yeah. sub-markets look like? Yeah, so we have two customer segments that we focus on. Health yeah. enthusiasts, 
which is exactly what it sounds right. It's someone who lives a healthy lifestyle, really cares about what they put in their body, probably belong to an F45 or something like that. Yeah. Um, and then experience seekers who love the store experience. So probably the anti-internet type thing is they love the interaction. They love being in a store. They love seeing new items and are always like researching what's the latest diet trend or whatever else. So we look for where a lot of those people live um, in some level of density. And then, you know, we say, all right, let's try and carve out trade areas in these areas. Well, let me let me push that just a yeah. touch because I know that all the areas you've mentioned are the areas that most, not just retailers, but real estate folks want to go for all asset types. Sure. But, but then I, I have this concept that uh, we call the difference between CBDs and BBDs, right? Central business districts, be- better business districts. I recognize them that Sprouts is mostly suburban, yeah. but better business districts can be in a suburban area, which is a combination of live, work, play, yeah. um, very often near a university, very often near some other driver of this healthy lifestyle. So when I open the door to that, that opens the door to old school cities like Chicago, like New York, like even, you know, you can go further out in the Midwest, clubs. I, I can give you a neighborhood in each of these cities yeah. that has those characteristics. Not on your radar or might be on your radar? Yeah, so for us, we kind of thrive on fresh food. So in the, in the short midterm is we have to have a distribution center within 250 miles okay. of where a store is going to be. Mm-hmm. We're, we don't have one yet in the mid-Atlantic Northeast. But we're we, penetrating the mid-Atlantic. Yep, so that's one where... As soon as Brandon and I get on our horse and, and start moving in that area, as soon as we get to a certain number of stores, we, we will build a DC in the mid-Atlantic, mm-hmm. then fill out that market and then go to the next market. And to your point is Chicago, New York, et cetera, is all on the long-term radar. For Let's me. talk about this for a moment because when we talk about green and healthy lifestyle, not just looking for the individual, but the goods that you sell, yeah. distribution is enormously important because the right. way that people define green now is changing. Yeah. It's no longer just this is an organic, um, what was the term again, peach <laughs> yeah. uh, But it's also how, how many miles did it travel to get here? Right. And, and what means did it use to get here? So are these factors that are now important uh, for you and maybe for other grocers? Yeah, for sure. A good example is this 250 miles, right? I mean, we've taken millions of miles off the road because we opened two distribution centers over the past year. So tons of miles off the road, you know, smaller uh, uh, greenhouse emissions because of that. We really thrive on local, um, particularly in produce, so in Good season, point. we're all about that and about our communities. Um, it's interesting that we just kind of redid our core values, mm-hmm. and one of them is care. And we say, you know, we care about our team members, the communities, our planet, um, et cetera. And we're starting to put our money where our mouth is across the whole the whole spectrum. Let's take a um, California fruit. It's funny. I grew up in New York. grew up in the East Coast. Uh, yeah. Brandon's a Philadelphia guy, so probably similar experience. Every time I go to California, the fruit is so much better than the <laughs> yeah. East Coast. You know what I'm yeah. saying? I mean, well, I mean, yeah. Jersey tomatoes are pretty good. Oh, okay. not yeah. fruit, but I mean, it's yeah. Just, yeah. No, it's funny you say yeah. that. So I'm from Boston, right? Yeah. <laughs> we used to go and look to see corn, right? Mm-hmm. So anytime we went to the West Coast for corn, we were like, oh, it's like twice the size and like so much better. <laughs> but the amount of money it costs to ship something from mm-hmm. California all the way to Boston you'd be paying $10 for an ear of corn. I mean, the way produce works, right, is it, you know, it goes to California, kind of goes down to Mexico, South America, then goes back over to Florida and up the coast. Mm -hmm. But each area is its own different experience. But we have that level of expertise in the company. We know where to get good product when. Well, I think the consumer is also getting more savvy because I think the consumer is saying, you know what, I'd rather have the New Jersey tomatoes or the Maryland corn. I'm from Maryland. The corn is really good there, too. (laughs) And is prepared to not have something. That's really the thing is is the consumer changing their ability or their – uh, preferences so much so that you know it's not season. This is going to come from too far away. I'm not eating you. Yeah, yeah, and I mean, part of what we did too is when we well, we added distribution centers on. We actually have local buying teams in each distribution center. Mm-hmm. So we have a buying team in Orlando that buys local Florida, Georgia when it's in season, et cetera, up the coast. Two in California. So we're trying to get local expertise in each area, talking mm-hmm. to the growers and farmers and trying to make everything special and local, uh, which I think makes a huge difference. This is probably the uh, a wrong reference, but I remember 
oh boy, this has got to be 50, 60 years ago, when the fish market and the guy or the woman would stand on the on the coast and the ships would come in yeah. and like literally pointing out yeah. what, what they yeah. want. Yeah. I went to the Japanese version. I was in Tokyo. They actually, oh, very cool. it was a very cool experience, like the real deal. Yeah. But what you're really doing is the produce version of that. Maybe yeah. sometimes with the- We actually do the same thing with seafood too. We have to, each, you know, mm -hmm. each area is a different seafood supplier because of that, mm -hmm. right? Because each coast is going to have different product and different levels of freshness. Yeah, but the one thing, I want to touch on that real quick quick is you're talking about the quality, the freshness, it's local, it's not expensive. Mm -hmm. It's a great point. Right? So we haven't really talked about pricing or cost for this. That's the benefit of it. So we can really reach across all segments of population. It's not an expensive offering. And that's been like the heritage of Sprouts too since the beginning. I mean, right. it started in the 50s as a farm stand, right? And it was always low price, high quality produce. And to this day, it's the same proposition. But some of the biggest retailers that are not in grocery, they are known for their logistics prowess. For sure. And I think what you've mentioned with your distribution centers, first of all, I know how many stores you have, about 400. How yeah. many distribution centers do you have? Uh, seven. Seven of them. And they're sort of strategically located exactly. near these areas. Now, do you own yours or do you lease them? Uh, lease. And are these cold storage? Uh, yes. Yeah, so they're all you know fresh distribution centers, mostly produce that comes out of them. Okay. Okay. And so this really gets to, I think, the key question in retail for the last 10 years. Is industrial going to subsume, eat the lunch of retail, putting it in basic terms, or is it a partner? How do you guys look at that? I mean, for us, it's a partner, it's right? Partner. I mean, we have a yeah. lot of partnerships as a result of, you know, what we need, right? And, and, and part of that. And in some instances, we, we kind of have this hybrid thing. Some facilities we run ourselves, other facilities someone else runs. But, I mean, as we need to open more and more of these distribution facilities, is it's all about partnerships for us. Someone has to be really good at handling produce and keeping it fresh or else the consumer loses. So definitely needs to be a partner. Brandon, let's go back to a point you just mentioned before that this is not a high-priced offering. This is right. something that could really uh, fulfill the needs of people up and down the income spectrum. Mm -hmm. uh, so you know, putting stores in areas that are not as wealthy, that mm -hmm. maybe uh, you push people to be, have a healthier lifestyle, is that something you think is or should be on the table, Brandon? Oh, it is on the table for sure. They, have, they absolutely have stores in those areas. Mm -hmm. um, some of their highest-performing stores are in areas that are not necessarily considered, quote, affluent or upper upper income areas. Remember what Dave mentioned earlier, it's about uh, health and health enthusiasts, re uh, recreation seekers. Mm -hmm. that, that covers all, all the whole spectrum of demographic. Mm -hmm. You don't have to be wealthy just to, you know, and be a health enthusiast. So yeah, we have stores pretty much across the board in terms yeah. of from a, from a demographic perspective. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting in some places, other health food type stores they'll never go because their consumers need to be wealthy and ours don't. And a big piece of that is because we're really well-priced on produce. Well, that's why I went to pricing is yeah. because you yeah. can cover that and that's what makes the, the Sprouts even more special. Mm -hmm. So in terms of the um, ESG thing, we've talked about it at some yeah. length here. Uh, talk to me just a little bit more about some of the co-tenancy um, beyond just the values, which I think we all understand, healthy lifestyle. Any types of retailers that you think you say, boy, we would really like to be there? Yeah, I think anything that kind of revolves around health, mm -hmm. right? We do well when we're around kind of fitness facilities, gyms, but we really don't like it because they take a lot of parking up. Okay. But small format specialty like an F45 and Orange Theory, those types of things where there's only 25, 30 people in a class and they rotate right. through yep. is perfect for what we're trying to do. Um, you know, I'd, like you said, is that something like an Allbirds? I think would be terrific. And REI, I think would be terrific. So those types of retail that bring like-minded individuals, I think, are, are really great co-tenancy for us. You know, I'm, I'm not hearing the bowling alley. You see, yeah, I mean, that, would, that, alley that was the old school much. of... Yeah, uh, yeah no it, bowling alleys. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but near universities, we typically do well near universities. So anything that has to relate to that demographic as well. Mm -hmm. So uh, now you're all domestic, correct, in, right. in the U.S.? Have, have you ever thought about going outside the U.S.? Um, well, it's funny. So our CEO is from uh, Scotland, mm -hmm. and he brings up every now and again that he thinks we should build one in Glasgow. 
Of course. Mm -hmm. but, right? Yeah, sure. but uh, it's not within 250 miles of a distribution center, so I don't know that that's going to happen anytime. Yeah, I mean, I think we have plenty of work to do. I mean, we think we could build a thousand stores mm -hmm. in the U.S. So you know, like you said, we're at close to 400. We got plenty of ways to go, but who says we won't be in Canada at some point or? Who knows? Well, one of the challenges, I guess, in, in a lot of these shows that we talk about, where do you put your real estate? I think we've already identified high growth, health conscious. But labor, that is a probably a key factor uh, for all of our different types of um, real estate owners. Uh, there ain't much of it. It's scarce. It's expensive. How, how much is that playing into your decisions? Yeah, I'd say a little bit less into the decisions. Um, more, I think, what we're trying to do more proactively Right, is we're trying to get higher wages. We're trying to get people more engaged to our team members in our stores. Um, because we're a fast growth company, the number of promotions every year is unbelievable. I mean, I want to say it was you know, 20, 30 percent of the workforce got promoted in the past year. So you know, we have a high level of upward momentum um, in the company, and, and it's a company you can grow with, which, which I love. There are labor concerns, Spencer, but really at the heart of it, it's we've got to get the right real estate. And so it's the real estate first, and you, mm -hmm. I mean, I hate to say it, you figure it out. You, you worry about the labor later. Mm -hmm. Well, that's different. I mean, I would just, being directed in yeah, the no, office sector, and, and even the industrial distribution center uh, business, people are saying labor is the limiting factor. And now you may have a 250-mile radius, but right. you may put it in this town versus that town. For sure, or from a, from a distribution point of view, that oh, yeah. is, we definitely think of, all right, where is the labor force going to come from when we decide on where the location is going to be. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, I think uh, my colleague, uh, Brian Reed, who's our, one of our producers, visited one of your stores the other day, uh, and he counted up the number of egg varieties you had there. <laughs> and I think he, he said there were not 10, not 20, there were 28 different types of eggs. That's a lot of eggs. Yeah. And, and so my, my question is, that's super cool, that's super different, but is that inefficient? No, it's a great question. Part of what we try and do is we carry items that other people don't carry. Um, and as we do it because we really think our target customers are very intrigued by that. So you think of eggs, and part of it's an animal welfare thing, mm -hmm. right? So every egg in our shelf is cage free or better, mm -hmm. right? And some people want it, you know, pasture raised. Some people want omega threes in it. And we have this whole thing around product where it's attributes of a product, right? So if it's organic or keto or paleo, or whatever it might be, is wh whatever we think our customers are going to be interested in. We go after it, and sometimes it's terrific, and sometimes it's a crash and burn, mm -hmm. but you move on. So like I was saying earlier, we turn over our assortment a lot. Mm -hmm. um, it's because we want to be ahead of trends, mm -hmm. not at trend, um, which is why I think from like a— That's a great line. From a, Thanks. Right? That is a great <laughs> line, ahead of trends. Mm -hmm. no. So from a real estate point of view, I mean, one of the selling points we think we have is, number one is if we're in an area— especially like a new area, we draw from pretty far because no one does what we do, right? It's not like having another X retailer who's, it's their seventh store in that market. For us, it's something special and people come from far and wide to try and get what we do because typically we're a second shop, right? Someone goes somewhere and they get their Tide and, and Coke and Frito-Lay products and then they come to us for, you know, someone has a gluten-free allergy, and we have more gluten-free offerings and categories than anyone else. Um, or they eat only organic, and we have thousands of organic items. It's definitely, I think, a great selling point for us is we do have a really deep assortment, but only where we think it matters. And by the way, you mentioned that they'll go somewhere else for the other stuff. We, we have no problem going across the street from, yeah. from them. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, we and have, sometimes it's great. Yeah, we actually have no issue with that whatsoever. And I bet that many of them want you there. Yeah. Because it makes that more people go to their offering. So it's a symbiotic sort yeah, of exactly. relationship. Yeah, exactly right. Uh, we need to sell that more. Yeah. <laughs> well, you, you gave me the word uh, peacherine. I'm going to give you the word symbiotic. There you, go. That. Okay. you see that? There We're you all learning something here yeah. today. Yeah, keep that up. So, uh, I mean, one of the beauties of your store uh, isn't just the offering and everything we talked about. It, it, the size, the footprint is very manageable in most shopping centers. Right. So you have a tremendous amount of options that many other grocers just don't because they are much larger. So, Brandon, from your perspective, I mean, you represent a lot of tenants. Yep. And they look at lots of grocers or 
farmers markets or things of that nature. What's your main pitch when you're walking in the door and say you want a Sprouts versus somebody else? Well, that's what we talked about for the last half hour. Yeah. I mean, it's really the offering. It's the quality of the product at the correct price. Uh, in urban environments, obviously, the size of the space uh, re- helps us significantly, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, it's very hard to get these big boxes in an urban setting. Um, but really, from Sprout standpoint, when I'm in there selling it, you think about who, this is not a cookie-cutter grocer. And for that, it has meaning to landlords, right? We're mm-hmm. not the prototypical 50,000-foot box that just goes in there that's selling a little bit of everything. This is a, a unique offering um, that brings a, a great crowd to their center. And I would just say we're, we're pretty malleable as far as the types of customers that go in there, right? You don't need to be rich. We do really well in heavy Hispanic areas, heavy Asian yep. areas. It's pretty amazing how well we perform at a pretty wide spectrum of demographics. Not a lot of grocery stores can can do that. Well, it's interesting. Uh, we'd, we had analyzed... Um, years ago, certain types of ethnic grocers. And they actually had tremendous sales per square foot in many of these stores. Their their challenges have always been this credit versus cool thing. And we're trying to move the market in many ways to say, look, you know, non-traditional credit is something that you should be looking at if they can have the sales, if they can have the foot traffic. But you have the best of both worlds. You've got the sales and you've got the credit. Right. So let's ask a final thoughts wrap-up question. Uh, 400 stores today, just tr- tremendous offering. Five years from now, looking back, not just the number of stores, but what changes do you see in your business uh, coming over the next five years or so? Let's we'll start with the real estate side. We're shooting for 10% store growth a year. Um, and you know we want to kind of saturate our markets, right? And there's a lot of good reasons to do that, right? I think that's kind of the future where we are. I really hope when you're in a California market or you're in Arizona, people know our brand really well, right? So we can open up a store. We don't even barely need to market it because people know the brand and they're really excited about us coming into the community. My hope over the next five years is we can do that for all these new markets we're going into. So, you know, New Jersey, D.C., Maryland, Georgia, Florida, that every time we go into a new community is like, all right, now it's our fifth store in that market and people kind of get what we're about. We're just trying to bring fresh, healthy food to more and more uh, neighborhoods, which you know is, is kind of exciting to be part of that too. But when you ask the management team at Sprouts, you know, one of the reasons why they're there, every one of them quotes is they kind of believe in the, the vision and, and what we're trying to do and kind of this higher purpose versus just, you know, you're, you're coming to work every day. Brandon, same question to you. You've been in this business a long time, mm-hmm. represented a lot of grocers and other retailers. Five years looking back, tell us about what you see as the, uh, uh, what Sprouts is going to look like, but the grocery business overall. Uh, boy, that's, that's a hard one. So I, I think what you're going to see is you won't see much change from what you see today. Okay, so you're going to look back and you're really, you will see grocers become obviously um, – much smarter about what they're doing. I, but I think what you're also going to see is a lot of these grocers going more, what's the word that they, when they use their own brand? It's just yeah, private label. Private yeah. label uh, than anything else because of the savings there, which will really push people more towards the sprouts of the world. Mm-hmm. But you don't see, I guess this question, the last question for both of you mm-hmm. is, you know, we track very closely internet penetration of different categories of um, retail goods. And um, the overall percentage is around 20% uh, of a grocery is somewhere around five, depending upon how you calculate it. Mm-hmm. Is that going to get much higher? No. I don't, I don't think, think so either. So. I mean, it's, it's funny. to do it. It's- if you look at Europe, um, you know, look at England. It's very small country. Logistically, you can get everywhere pretty quickly. And I think it's about 20% in grocery. And that's having the best logistics possible. I don't think it's going to get more than in this, it kind of where it is right now, which for us is in this 10%. Mm-hmm. That's kind of where everyone's. Yeah. But it was all COVID related. I mean, all of a sudden, everyone's like, oh, I, you know, I don't want to go to a store. Now I get this level of convenience. And across the board, I mean, even Target, they just announced, I think they saw 2 3% growth 
um, and they're putting a lot of energy into it. So I think it's going to stay around the same. Yeah. And I think you need to segregate the market between the boxed goods and the fresh produce. That's For where sure. that's Absolutely. where yeah. that, that's where that ten yeah, percent yeah. number yeah. comes in. And yeah. my five yeah. percent is the produce number, right. really. Yeah. And for our format, we really don't want to get any bigger because we want the store experience and the freshness and et cetera for people in the store. Excellent. Well, thank you to both. Uh, my good friend, Brandon Famous, Executive Vice President of CBRE. Thanks, Thank you for Thanks. joining us. And Dave McGlinchey, Chief Strategy Officer of Sprouts Farmers Market. Terrific job today. Thanks Thank for you coming so much. Out. Appreciate it. Thanks, Zach. Thanks for checking out this episode on Sprouts Farmers Market and its special approach to the grocery business. For more, check out our website, cbre.com slash the weekly take. We'll be back next week. Meanwhile, don't forget to share the show as well as subscribe, rate, and review us wherever you listen. I'm Spencer Levy. Be smart, be safe, be well.